uh, a merger may potentially result in some diseconomies of scale and yet still be attractive because it allows uh, people to raise prices. Um, it also has the perverse effect that if companies are allowed to merge a lot, imagine that I'm McDonald's and Burger King is going to come into my market, right? If I know that I'm allowed to merge with McDonald's, then that's going to give me a much bigger incentive to come into the market because they're going to want to buy me to stop me from comp competing with them, right? On the other hand, if I thought that no matter what, if I entered the market, McDonald's couldn't merge with me, then I'm not going to have a big incentive to enter the market and compete with them. And that effect's going to be bigger the sort of more that the company that's entering is just imitating the old company, right? And so, uh, give it, allowing mergers um, based on... Uh, this actually won't be in an upcoming problem set, by the way. But um, allowing mergers may provide an incentive for companies to come in who are not really providing a beneficial new product but something that's just imitating uh, a current product. <coughs> they can be bought out and get some of the profits uh, associated with that, that big company. So that one, that's one reason why mergers may give bad incentives. Yeah, Terrence. Was that really prevalent in the dot-com boom, where a lot of new companies can, like, come in to like, the search engine market just to get bought out? By yeah, so that's, that's, I think that's a, that's a good example. And merger policy could, in principle, be a way of trying to deter that sort of stuff. So the example I usually give in like the fast food industry is you think, you know, if there's currently McDonald's, what you want is um, something like KFC to enter, not Burger King. Because Burger King doesn't add that much given that McDonald's is already there, KFC might add quite a bit. And uh, Burger King is going to be much more attracted into the market if mergers are allowed because it wants to get a chunk of McDonald's part of the market. If mergers aren't allowed, KFC might be more likely to enter because they're not directly competing that much with McDonald's and therefore a merger wouldn't benefit them that much. And intellectual property uh, is a really crucial way of gaining monopoly. Um, and today I'm going to mostly emphasize the benefits that it brings in terms of encouraging people to create new products, but it can also encourage some wasteful things. So for example, uh, intellectual property can, can sometimes uh, incentivize firms to try to like just beat the other firm to get the patent, right? Uh, even though they both have the idea. And that can be very wasteful because it's not like you're really creating anything new. It's just that you're trying to get the, the patent, right? Or you can try to steal someone's intellectual property to try to get a patent on it before, before they have it. So, uh, Schumpeter, in the article that you read, emphasized the importance of these dynamics um, <coughs> to thinking about uh, how industries work and, you know, and what makes them work well. So his argument was that the monopoly distortion is actually very small, just like Harberger uh, measured it. But the importance of creating innovation is huge. Like The reason that we've made so much progress uh, over the last 300 years is that people are constantly coming up with new ways of producing new products and so forth. And that therefore the creative power of capitalism is really driven by its ability to give incentives for innovation rather than by its ability to reduce the distortions from monopoly. Um, and so uh, Schumpeter claims that the real um, the really important issues in industrial economics are not about competitiveness, but about the competitive process, about ensuring that people can easily come into the market, compete, and uh, create new products, and can gain profits from doing that. Um, so, Abigail, um, could you tell us a little bit about what um, you know Schumpeter means, like what types of things could have an effect on? the process of creative disruption? Cody? Yeah. Pony Express. Imagine if we're sending yep. mail with yep. that typewriter yep. versus a computer. Yep. Um, Whiteboards instead of chalkboards. Yeah, no, so there's clearly been a lot of technical change over time. But what does, what, what does Schumpeter say about, does anyone remember what Schumpeter sort of says about how this works, or you know, what the dynamics of it are, or what makes it work well, or 
Yeah, yeah. Taryn talks about the process of innovation being um, necessary because companies or firms want to capture that monopoly profit when yeah. they first innovate. Yeah. And then, so, yeah, he says there's far too much emphasis on the static distortion. And that the greatest threat to monopoly power is not competition so much as it is that someone will innovate you and make your product over you and make your product irrelevant. So that what really, you know, in the end eliminates monopoly power is not the fact that a bunch of people come and compete against Nokia making the same types of phones, but the fact that someone invents an iPhone and nobody wants to buy any phone like Nokia at all anymore. Right? And so if a monopolist in this sort of a process becomes too comfortable, he ends up getting left behind by new technology. Um, and therefore, the main goal of industrial policy should be to incentivize this kind of creative destruction where people are constantly coming in, uh, making obsolete the products that were produced by the last generation while building on them at the same time. And that much of this may require concentrated industries, both to give rewards for creating products and to give sufficient size that firms can invest in research and development. Um, and so what that means is that to a large extent, the whole standard idea that we just want a very competitive industry doesn't make very much sense because if most of what we want to do is encourage innovation, we should think about what policies will achieve that goal rather than uh, what policies will just reduce the monopoly distortion, which may be very small relative to the effects of innovation. Um, so some examples of this in action are, you know, Facebook, which leaped over the previous social networks, right, and basically put them all out of business, um, even though it had many competitors that were came to market before it did. Apple had just repeatedly uh, changed the markets for a variety of products. It changed the market for the tablets. It changed the market for the iPhone, uh, for uh, phones, and so forth. Um, and as a company, it's not actually been defined by any one of these products in particular, but rather by the process that they have for generating products that disrupt and change markets in this way. Um, and uh, Google has been very similar as well. So every year Google is coming out with a new application that's sort of creating a whole new market that's changing the way that you know search works or that travel works or that uh, directions work and so forth. And even though, again, they were a latecomer to many of these markets, the way they competed was by fundamentally changing how the market worked, not by uh, just doing something similar to what the other firms do. So. You might think that Google's current dominant position in the market, even though you know, it has lots of problems, it means Google controls a lot of things, might be worth it because it gave Google an incentive to um, you know, undertake all the innovations. So uh, an another great example of that is the smartphone apps market, which basically changed the whole way that uh, applications are delivered to people. Um, and basically, you know, there's different business models in the smartphone world almost every six months. It's like, you know, I, I have a phone that's almost two years old now and I feel like it's from the Stone Age because, uh, you know, every six months there's like a whole new generation of this stuff that changes the whole way things work. Yeah, but Under Google's trailblazing, yeah. what about something like Google Plus, which is like a failure? Like, Wait, isn't Google that Plus? Yeah, I mean, like, it's like a failure, right? Like, well, see, so that's the great thing about the marketplace is that stuff that sucks doesn't work and doesn't make them any profits, and stuff that's great... But isn't that a waste because like they put so much time and energy into making Google Plus and it doesn't, and it, and it, and it wasn't, they were trying to do something that Facebook was doing it, like Facebook. Well, so I, so I agree, but the, but the point, well, so there may be some inefficiencies there, I agree, but more generally, I think the good, I mean, most ideas fail, even if they have a good chance of succeeding ex ante, the great thing about the market, though, is that by, in the, with the notable exception of um, edible arrangements, filtering out crappy companies from the industry, making sure they don't make profits, and making sure companies that come up with great ideas do make profits, um, it, encourage, it doesn't encourage a lot of crappy products to be created, because companies will know that they can't make much money on that. Um, 
And other systems that you could have for rewarding new products might not have that property. Um, and, and your problem set will explore that. Yeah. Okay. So, um, to just try to, you know, re-emphasize the importance of these dynamic effects in industrial economics relative to the traditional static effects, um, I want to draw an analogy to criminal justice. So, most criminal activity is by poor people, not by rich people, right? So, there's a famous quote from Anatole France, which says that the law in its majestic equality forbids the poor and rich man equally from sleeping underneath the bridge. Uh, which uh, basically says that, you know, most criminal activity is not murder or rape or anything like that. It's, it's, it's uh, uh, property crimes. It's people stealing stuff, right? And to, overwhelmingly, the people who steal are poorer than the people who they steal from. And uh, this entails, this is basically just a transfer, but from a you know, redistributive perspective, uh, the poor person probably needs the stuff more than the rich person does, right? Their marginal utility is likely higher. So from a purely static perspective, you know, just looking at you know, what the effect of this is, you might say crime is really good. Yeah, Ben. But I, I disagree because, like, if you look at, like, the south side of Chicago, yep. most people getting mugged, there's probably, like, intra, like, it's crime, like, in the neighborhood, right? So it's, like, yeah. poor people sitting from poor people. It's not, like, poor people going to the north side and sitting from the rich people who have too much. It's, like, like yeah. you just get a new, like, you get your new TV, and, like, and you just barely have a new TV, yeah. and your that's getting taken instead of, like... Well, so to some extent that's money. true, but then you could say, well, okay, so only poor people stealing from rich people should be allowed or something like right. that. Right. Clearly we don't, but... I don't think we believe in that either, right? I don't think we think stealing should be permitted, period, right? Uh, I'm saying, like, in effect, crime isn't redistributed. Well, so I think the statistics show that, that, it, that it is. I mean, it's true. There is some within-community crime, but to the extent there's cross-community crime, it's almost always from poor communities to rich communities. Yeah, Steve? Um, I was just going to say that uh, <clears throat> there actually was recently, uh, last year, it actually had a little bit of a spike of... of uh, People coming up from the south side and mugging people up on the north side. Really? Yeah. That's interesting. I'm gonna take a bus all the way to Mount Well, so anyway, why, 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 if I mean, to the extent, let, let's leave aside Ben's story and let's just think about Robin Hood type uh, uh, stealing, right? Uh, why don't we make that legal? Well. Um, I think we're afraid. Yeah, Victor. One of the causes of huge inefficiencies is people build up their own private police forces. Yeah. Is that? <laughs> so I most don't know. The, like, like that's inefficiency right now is that there's like a police force. But like, it wouldn't it be even more inefficient if everybody had their own private one. Well, yeah. So that's what I was going to talk about. So yeah. So redistribution. So let me just make the case for why, if we ignore the incentive effects created by this. In some ways, it makes a lot of sense to just make it legal, right? So uh, most of the <coughs> efficiency loss comes from people trying to prevent crime. If it was just, you know, made legal, then then people w wouldn't be able, you know, try to prevent it. And so, from a static perspective, crime should be legal, right? We should just let poor people steal from rich people. Um, this is obviously an absurd conclusion. None of us believe that that's the right prescription, but the useful thing about reaching absurd conclusions is it leads you to examine your premises and it leads you to think about what, um, in what other situations you may be using similar premises and reaching conclusions that don't seem as obviously absurd but actually are just as absurd. So, um, and the key is exactly what Victor was talking about, which is what are the long-term or dynamic effects of crime, right? And um, the reason why crime is illegal is because <laughs> if it were legal, um, it would encourage uh, a bunch of people to become professional criminals rather than being productive workers, right? And that would be just a huge waste of social resources, right? You could have all these people producing things and instead they take, spend all their time just stealing from other people, right? It can also lead um, to, as Victor was saying, a huge amount of waste uh, in preventing other people from stealing from you. Um, <coughs> And it would discourage people working hard, I think, a lot more than the optimal way of redistributing would, because people would be very in.